Hi, I'm Ron, and welcome to Counter a podcast where we try to give bite sized chunks of modern world history. We're a new podcast, so if you fumble something along the way, please forgive us. I find Christ fascinating, and I hope that you would too. And with that now, let's get started on the Mercedes Benz 300 SL. Alright, so picture this scene, right? Early 1950s, World War II is over, and Germany's trying to get on it, back on its feet from being absolutely annihilated, right? And Mercedes Benz decides, you know what, let's put a car that will make everyone's jaw drop. And that's exactly what they did, right? So, the 300 SL as we know it today started life as a pure racing car, right? So, and Mercedes wasn't messing around. They wanted to show the world that they could still, you know, build these incredible machines, uh, build these incredible machines that they had before, right? And so, in 1952, they rolled out the W194 300 SL race car. This thing was absolutely ridiculous, right? It had this amazingly like advanced space frame chassis that was actually so high on the sides normal doors wouldn't work right so of course the mad lads at mercedes were like all right whatever screw it let's make the doors open upwards calling it quote an engineering necessity and so just like that the beautiful iconic going doors were born now okay race car is cool and all right but i think i feel like the real magic happens or i should say the real magic happened when some guy named max hoffman got involved right uh, the next episode is going to be on him. Amazing dude, right? Beautiful story. But basically, right, Hoffman was a car importer. And so for this, he was a Mercedes importer. And he convinced them to make a road-going version of their 300 SL road car. And Mercedes, right? Probably still dizzy from all the racing, su- racing success the car had. They were like, sure, why not? Got straight to work, right? So then, a couple years later, 1954, they unveiled the 300 SL goal link at the New York Auto Show. And there's some pictures, you can Google it, right? Absolutely stunning and jaw-dropping. People, like, lost their minds, right? So here's this, like, beautifully sleek, futuristic car with doors, like, opening up to the heavens. Absolute spaceship, especially in 1950s America. Like, let's be real. Right? So, like, going beyond just appearances, right? It wasn't just about looks. Under the hood, right? This beautifully long-sculpted hood was this 3-liter straight-six engine. And so... We think about it, right? 215 horsepower, nothing much, right? Like, my GTI is, like, what, 220, something like that? But, like, think about it, right? 1950s, and, like, the car doesn't weigh that much? That's, like, supercar territory. And so, the engine also, not to get too mechanical, blah, 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 it was at a 50-degree tilt under the hood, right? It was actually the first production car to have a four-stroke direct injection system. So, not, like, carburetors and things of... 1950s right but no they were like oh we'll get fuel injection and so that's what they did right in 1954 it's kind of crazy all the way up to like the 70s and up right you know muscle cars and carburetors and whatnot kind of cool and so this tech right immensely helped this 300 sl and it actually hit a top speed of 163 miles an hour mind-blowing in 1950s right and so obviously depending on the gearing asterisk whatever right (laughs) okay and so most people actually like in the 1950s think about it most people were happy to do like what 60 miles an hour without their car like falling to pieces 300 sl could do 0 to 16 8.8 seconds blazingly fast for the time right and so also right it's also a pretty nice car on the inside interior was like hella swanky you know leather seats big steering wheel that you could also like move and get out of the way because like big golden doors and kind of awkward shuffle to get in and so beautiful dash flow gauges that made sense to someone somewhere you know <laughs> and so <laughs> i think this is pretty funny the car also had an optional luggage set which was custom fitted to the small trunk so even if you're in this like massive beautiful race car drive thing still like come on luxury because if you're spending you know big bucks on a car why would you not splurge on the matching luggage right <laughs> now okay on to like actually driving the car I can't say I've done it, but like, you know, it's the internet, right? Driving the 300 SL wasn't apparently exactly a walk in the park. First, basically, obstacle you encounter is the going doors. Tilt up, you gotta like do some weird shimmy to get over the wide door sills, awkward shuffle to get into the seat. But once you're in, right, you really better hope it wasn't a hot day because ventilation, 1950s, we'll just call it challenging <laughs> and the windows didn't exactly roll down right you just had these little vent windows that basically didn't do a whole lot of much but like honestly right creature comforts none of that mattered when you were cruising down the road in this like road legal race car right 
beautifully flashed, handling well, I mean, especially for the 1950s, and it looked like absolutely nothing else on the road, right? People say it does have a tendency to oversteer, which could, you know, like, catch inexperienced drivers off guard, but, like, it's just more flavor and excitement, right? <laughs> like, and so on to the production numbers, Mercedes built approximately four, I shouldn't say approximately, they built exactly 1,400, actually, so read the script, uh, 1,400 coupes between 54 and 57, they did make a roadster version of the car, 57, I believe it was 63, but, like, if we're being real, like, it's not really as cool as the Gold Link. The Gold Link is, like, the 300 to sell. The Roadster did address some issues, you know, it had, like, normal doors, better ventilation, improved handling with new suspension, blah, blah, blah. But, like, it's not just a car, it's, like, also a statement, right? It showed that, like, Mercedes was back, Mercedes was back, and that German engineering was still, you know, a force to be reckoned with. Even if, you know, their tanks didn't exactly work. <laughs> okay. And so, basically, it set the stage for all the Mercedes-Benz sports cars that you would see now up to, you know, today's AMG GT. And so, but the 300 SL's influence wasn't just, you know, limited to Mercedes, but also, like, outside, right? So, it helped establish this template of, like, what a lot of modern sports cars, like, set out to be. Which is combining that racing technology, the high performance, and the luxury amenities to set a new standard that would be, like something for people to match years to come, right? So, now into these days, right? If you want a 300 SL, better have some really deep pockets, right? They fetch millions at auction. Not bad for a car that was 11,000, right? When new, which was adjusted for inflation, like 100,000 today. Still a lot of money, but like still. And so, there was actually some like special versions, aluminum body, blah, blah, blah. Basically, really expensive. Only 29 lightweight versions were made, which was the lightweight version, the better one, yeah, and so those are like some of the most valuable in the world, right? And so like, zooming out of everything, the 300 SL has really left this like, massive mark on car culture, right? Fascinated, and f been featured in, you know, countless movies, TV shows, video games, been reimagined and homaged by so many designers over so many decades, even Mercedes couldn't resist going back, right? You know, creating the SLS AMG with, you know, its own set of going doors as a tribute. Not sure it lives up to, you know, the original, but whatever, right? So next time you know you do see a modern car with the fancy going doors that open upwards, which I'll admit isn't that often, but you know, Tesla, the occasional Model X, whatever, right? Remember, like, the 300 SL did it first, and like, probably, arguably the best, I'm not gonna lie. And it's not just like a car, right? It's this piece of just automotive artwork, a testament to what happens when, you know, Mercedes does let their engineers go a little crazy and possibly like, one of the coolest shapes to grace four wheels. So that wraps up another episode of Counter Steer. Hopefully you learned something new or just had something to listen to. Uh, the next episode will be on Max Hoffman, which I didn't know about that much myself, but like researching it, he's actually a really cool dude. And so have a nice day. I'll catch you later.